Thanks. It's really good to, to connect. And um, what I thought I would do would be to um, do a little bit of, of um, how our work at Green Faith has evolved over the years, and then share our sense of where things stand currently. Um, you know, not so much with climate change, which we all know is not good, <clears throat> but in terms of uh, religious responses, religious and spiritual responses that we're seeing and, and where we stand on that. And I, I'm, I'd love to make this more of a, a back and forth. So feel free to introduce and I'm, I'm, I'll talk for 10 minutes at the most now and then would like to, would like to go um, back and forth if that sounds, if that sounds good. Um, we, we got started uh, 30 years ago, actually, as an all-volunteer organization in the state of New Jersey because uh, 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 Christian and Jewish colleagues went to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, and they had you know, what they considered to be a religious experience. They went and heard <clears throat> about what was happening to the planet and had this awakening in the midst of a global UN meeting that there had to be a religious response. And at that point in time, there was, you know, sort of, as we say in the US, a big nothing burger in terms of religious action on, on climate change and the environment. I mean, apart from just a few theologians, very, very little, nothing organized. Um, they got started by, um, uh, organizing educational sessions where they would say, here's what the Bible teaches about the environment and so, so forth. And sort of limped along for a while because it was just difficult to get people to understand the connection. And, um, you know, in, in this crowd, I can use this analogy. It was a little bit like if you said, you know, religion and the environment, it was like a, a koan, right? I mean, people would stare as if it was a, a deep mystery that needed to be contemplated on for, for days before anybody understood what what the connection was, that's really different now, um, thank God. But it 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 wasn't the case back then, and so the group um, actually was very close to going <clears throat> out of existence because there were it was a difficult thing to get feedback and get engagement. And I'd become involved as a volunteer and was looking for an opportunity to. Um, do take my work into a, a new direction. And, and like a whole lot of people, um, early in my life, my strongest experiences of God had, had happened outdoors. And this is utterly common. <laughs> um, you know, the social science research that backs it up. Um, and interestingly, we did, a, a, we did several hundred interviews of people from different religious backgrounds about and their outdoor spiritual experiences. And you realize these experiences are, are everywhere. And we actually even got contacted and this theme will resurface later in when I talk by a number of atheists who were upset that we weren't interviewing atheists about their spiritual experiences outdoors, which I think to me is a, a it, it's a sign that, that what this is about is a lot bigger than, um, our systems of meaning often know how to contain and, and, and hold. Um, so I, um, along with some other colleagues and friends got involved. We started doing work in, in New Jersey, um, continuing with the education, helping religious facilities green up the way they operate, helping individuals adopt um, sustainable lifestyles. What really caught my attention, caught our attention, was we did what we called toxic tours, where we would take people um, working with local activist groups to Newark, New Jersey, which is a city that's scarred by um, the wounds of post-industrialism, massive numbers of contaminated sites, terrible air quality, one out of every three or four people has asthma. Um, and what we found is that when people, religious people actually saw um, and felt even just for an afternoon immersed in this reality. That was, that was what woke them up. 